Good to see each and every one of you this morning, and thank you for being here as always. Uh, we have several, I believe, that are out of town uh, going on trips and stuff this week, but we have a lot of visitors here today, so we ask that you stay around a little bit longer and let us get a chance to know you. So thank you, everyone, for being here, especially to do what we just did, uh, which is take the Lord's Supper. And, of course, we see the example of that in Acts, that the first century Christians would gather together on the first day of the week to remember the Lord and to proclaim His death till He comes. The Lord, before He died, you know, one of the things He wanted the disciples to know is, hey, we're going to have uh, an event, a worship moment, a worship activity where you remember me and you think about what I'm about to do for you. 1 Corinthians 11, if you're there, Paul, who was not present for the first uh, bringing about of the Lord's Supper, we see with the life of Jesus, but through the Holy Spirit, obviously has the information of what happened that night when the Lord instituted the Lord's Supper. Verse 23, he reminds the Corinthians about it. They should have already known about this. Verse 11, it says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after the supper, saying, and I want to stop right there. Of course, we can all cheat and we can read it, but what's the next thing that the Lord says here about the cup? Me and Dale and Sterling talked about this before the service started, and I want to make sure we were all on the same page about this. But I'm thinking about myself and my own self-reflection. When I usually take the Lord's Supper or when I've assisted on the Lord's Supper and prayed for the cup, the next thing that Jesus says is rarely brought up. We don't bring up what Jesus says. Usually what we say, and what we've said before, is the cup, which is the blood that was given for remission of sins. We immediately talk about forgiveness of sins. And it is true that Jesus' blood is what's brought about forgiveness of sins. Uh, it was very important to understand that we even see that in Matthew's account. Matthew these is the only account of the Lord's Supper where Jesus, too, the night he institutes the Lord's Supper, brings up forgiveness of sins. And we'll read that closer to the end. But in the four accounts of the Lord's Supper, all four of them bring something up else every single time. This is what it says. He took the cup after the supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Does the Lord say, take the cup here, which represents the blood that was given for forgiveness of sins? In this context here, in this chapter. Here, drink the cup and remember of my blood that gave you remission of sins. That's not what the Lord says. The Lord says the cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do in remembrance of me. Jesus puts a focus on the covenant. The cup represents the blood of the covenant. And all four accounts, when we have this in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and 1 Corinthians, John doesn't cover the Lord's Supper. It's all about the covenant. Now, Matthew gives you the covenant of the blood, which is for remission of sins that was shed for many. Matthew's going to give us that, and we'll talk about that in a second. But I want to ask us all the question, when we just took the cup, did we think about the new covenant? Because that's a big part of it, isn't it? That's the part that Jesus brings up. Now, remission of sins is part of the covenant, but it's not all about the covenant. I think what we're supposed to logically do in our minds when we take the Lord's Supper is, you know, step one is to think about the covenant. Step two is to think about the blood that was shed for the covenant. And then step three, where are we at? Well, now we're sitting in remission of sins. But I'm scared that if we're jumping straight to remission of sins, we've skipped the covenant. And it's the thing that the Lord told us to bring up. The thing that the Lord told us to remember, right? So what I want to do with this this morning is just talk about the covenant. Do we really know what the covenant is? Is it the thing we're thinking about when we take a part in the cup? This is what the Lord has asked us to do. Obviously, if we're going to talk about the covenant, I mean, we could talk about anything. We could open a random page here in this book and say, oh, let's start talking about the covenant right here. Because all the covenant is is the, the contract between us and God. It's the defined relationship that we're supposed to have, right? But what we'll really focus on here is when it comes to the symbols of that God gave us about the covenant. So what I want to do first, and I have five points. The first thing I want to do is let's just talk about the word covenant means. It should be a word that we all know, but can we actually define it? Do we know what the word covenant means? Secondly, and thirdly, we'll give two examples of the signs of the covenant we see in the Old Testament. 
covenants that were given, and the Lord saw it fit to give a symbol and a sign to remind the people and himself of the covenant. Then fourthly, we'll talk about the Lord's Supper itself and the symbols that they represent when it has to do with the covenant. And at the very end, we will talk about the blood of the covenant. And we'll talk about the remission of sins that comes along with that. So if you stay with me and follow along, we'll be jumping all through the Bible, but I hopefully we'll have some more reverence and respect for the signs that Jesus gave us for the covenant. What does covenant mean? I don't think before and then I can really give you a straight answer. I would just say, well, covenant means, you know, it means covenant. <laughs> That's exactly what it means. It means what it says. The word covenant comes from this uh, Aramaic word, which is like biret. It's interesting. It's not a Hebrew word. It's not a Greek word. It's an Aramaic word that we get covenant from. And covenant is kind of a difficult word to give a definition for because the best English word that fits that Aramaic word is covenant, right? If you look at different contexts, you'll see that many uh, scholars today use the word constitution. The reason why is because they used to word the they used to use the word league to describe covenant. And if you had your Strong's Concordance, you would go and you look up covenant, and the first thing they give you was it means league. And the problem is, is today in 2018, we don't use the word league like people used it 50 years ago or 100 years ago. So this is not really a perfect word that fits anymore. If I say the word league to you, I said that means covenant. What are you thinking when you hear league? You know, maybe you're thinking the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. (laughs) Or maybe you're thinking about Justice League, right? Those are the things we go to when we think of the word league. Now, what they've been doing lately in kind of the newer versions of the concordances is using this word, constitution. And for Americans, hopefully we do know what constitution means. Constitution, and if you listen to Schoolhouse Rock, you know the song, right? We the people, in order to perform a more perfect union... To establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, to provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare. I can say the whole thing because I know the song. (laughs) And so we know about that constitution. And what is that constitution supposed to be? Well, it's the defined relationship between the people of the United States of America and the federal government of the United States of America. It's our defined relationship between us and the federal government. When we look at the Bible, covenant is used the same way we would use the word constitution in a general sense. In context between two people in the Bible, the word covenant is used between a monarchy and its people. Sort of similar to a federal government and its people. I'm going to throw all these verses on the screen. 2 Samuel 5, 3. The word covenant is used, but it's to describe the relationship between David and the elders. 2 Samuel 5, 3. Therefore all the elders of the Israel came to the king of Hebron, and King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. what they do? They defined their relationship. They made a constitution. This is what David's responsibilities are going to be. This is what the people's responsibilities are going to be. This is David's promises. These are the people's promises. And they made a covenant because they defined their constitution. They defined their relationship. Covenant is also used in the Bible to describe marriage when it's used in the context between a husband and a wife. Malachi uses this example. He uses the example of marriage, but he's actually talking about the Lord and his people again. Malachi 2.14 says, Yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth, with whom you have dealt treacherously. Yet she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Right? Is the marriage relationship a covenant? It is. It is a defined relationship between a husband and wife and, guess who? God, right? And the three there are in a covenant relationship here on this earth. It's the Constitution. So then we use, obviously, what we use the most when we use the word covenant, which is the relationship between God and his people. And if you look at a you know, current version of Strong's, it will give you this phrase, a divine constitution. That is when the divine makes a relationship with his people and he defines the terms. And that is our covenant with our God. We see this word first used in Genesis 6. It's the first time we see the word covenant used. If you'll turn there to Genesis chapter 6, this will also give us our first sign of a covenant. Chapter 6, we see meet up with Noah and his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Noah and his sons and his wife and his wife's sons, they live in a world that we can't even imagine. 
They live in a world that's so evil that they are the only righteous family left on earth trying to serve God. Everyone else around them is evil. There's these mighty men of giants, these mighty men of valor that are controlling the world and running things. And Noah and his family are basically all on their own, except they have God. God comes and tells Noah, I'm going to destroy the world because of the situation that it's in, but I'm going to make a covenant with you. And so if we look at the beginning here, the first couple of verses, he gives the examples of the way the ark is supposed to look. He gives the commands for its construction. And then in verse 17, God says this, And behold, I myself am bringing floodwaters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh which is with the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die, but I will establish my covenant with you. And you shall go into the ark, you and your sons, and your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And every living thing that is on the flesh, you shall bring two of them to the ark, and keep them alive with you, and there shall be a male and a female. So that you can just see in this one little clipping of what the context is. The whole earth is going to be destroyed. Except for you, Noah, because I'm going to establish my covenant with you. The first thing we see about covenants with God here the first time it's used is it's always used alongside with salvation. When God comes in, he makes a covenant. It's about salvation for the people he's making the covenant with. And it's going to cost him something, right? And in this case, it costs him. This righteous person is going to have to do this work so that he can save his people. So we see our first sign of the covenant after they get off the ark. And what's the first sign of the covenant they have when they get off the ark? It is the rainbow. Right? That's what the Lord gives. We go all the way to Genesis chapter 9. It takes Noah around 100 years probably to construct the ark. He is on the ark for about a year. And then they settle on a mountaintop and the water recedes and he's able to go out. The first thing God, uh, Noah does when he leaves the ark is he makes an altar. And he sacrifices all the clean animals or some of all the clean animals on this altar. When we see this in Genesis 9, 1, 7... God smells it, he's pleased with the sacrifice, and he comes and he talks to Noah. The first thing that he tells Noah, basically, is there's something sacred about blood. It's the first rule he gives to Noah when he leaves the ark, that blood is sacred and you're not supposed to eat it. We continue to read in Leviticus, we learn more about this, and this is going to come into play with the covenant. But just here we learn there's something special about blood, and Noah is commanded not to eat it. When we get into the next couple of verses after verse 7, this is when God makes a covenant, not just with Noah, but with all living things and their descendants. Look here in verse 12. Excuse me, let's look at verse 8. (laughs) Verse 8 here. God says this, Then God spoke to Noah and said to his sons with him, saying, As for me, behold, I will establish my covenant with you and your descendants after you, with every living creature that is in you. That is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you. And all will go out of the ark, every beast of the earth. Thus I must establish my covenant with you. Never again shall all flesh be cut off from the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. Those are the terms of the covenant. I will never, ever flood the earth again. And is this covenant just with Noah? This is with all of Noah's descendants, isn't it? Who does that include, by the way? That includes you and me. We're descendants of Noah. Has it ever flooded again like this in our lifetime? No. Will it ever flood like this again in our descendants' lifetime? No. Because God's made a covenant with Noah. And now it's not just with Noah and his descendants, but who else is it made with? All living things, right? They're included in this covenant. And he gives his promise never to flood the earth ever again and attempts to destroy it. So then God creates a sign of the covenant. Look here in verse 12. And God said, This is a sign of the covenant which I made between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I set my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be for a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. It shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant which is between me and you And every living creature of flesh, the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. The rainbow shall be in the cloud, and I will look on it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, 
This is a sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh on the earth. We can stop there. But three times, God says, this is a sign of the covenant. And this rainbow is going to appear after it rains. And who's going to remember about the covenant? Is it going to be Noah? God says it's going to be me. God says it's going to remind himself that he's made a covenant with all people. Y'all can kind of see maybe where I'm going with this once I get to this point. You see how this covenant here is about salvation. You see how there's a symbol to remind someone about that covenant. And who's the person that's going to be reminded in this context? It's God. He has set before himself a reminder to remind himself. Hey, I've made a covenant with these people not to flood the earth again. There's going to be a symbol to remind, right? I just want to bring up one quick thought about this, because every time I preach about the rainbow, someone feels like they need to come and talk to me about it. And and what do you think people want to come and talk to you about when they talk about rainbows today? Not what I want to talk about. They want to talk about this, you know, group of people that use this as a symbol for their agenda, the homosexual community. That's what people want to talk about. And, And let me just say one thing about this so you're not thinking about it as we go forward. Does it really matter who's trying to take the rainbow as a symbol? Does it not mean what it means here in Genesis because someone else took it? Does God not still look at the rainbow? And what does God think about when he sees it? Well, it says here that God remembers the covenant he made with Noah and with all of his descendants. Should it mean any different to me? I don't think it should. Some of you that decided to go to UAB, there's something you're going to learn at UAB really quickly. It is a safe place. Oh, wow, is it a safe place. And I say that because every down the hallways in every single one of your professor's offices, they'll have a sticker that has a rainbow on it. And it says safe place, right? And the whole idea there is that homosexuals could flee to this professor's office because this is a safe place for for bullying. And I always say when I speak about this, bullying is wrong. It's sinful. And I think a lot of these people are in this situation because of the bullying that others have done to them. I think that's awful. I think every place in that sense needs to be a safe place, especially with Christians. We don't bully. That's never the aspect here. But when I walk through and I see all these safe places, I asked to my buddy one time, if it's the Christians I think that don't feel safe anymore. I think, it's, I think it's us that don't feel safe. But the more and more I read this passage, when you walk down the halls at UAB and you see all these little rainbows, what should you be thinking about? I probably think it's a good idea to think about what God thinks about when he sees a rainbow. You think about the covenant. The covenant that God's made with all human people. No matter where you see it. You see it up in the sky? That's about the covenant. You see it on a sticker? That's about the covenant. Right? That's what it's about. And no matter who takes it and who does what with it, guess what it's still going to be about? It's going to be about the covenant that God made with all people. Right? And we can see those things as very positive. I'm going to walk down the hallways at UAB. You know what I'm going to be thinking about? I'm going to think about God's promises because there's all these little reminders all over the place for that reason, at least in my mind. The next time we see the word covenant or a sign of the covenant is with circumcision. And we're going to go through this one relatively quickly. Remember in Genesis 17, God calls Abraham to be his special people. He makes a covenant with him. In Acts 17, in the first eight verses, he makes that covenant with Abraham and he gives the promises. In verse 7, we see the same thing we saw with Noah. That this is a covenant not just for Abraham, but for all of his descendants, all of the Jewish people. Not just with Abraham, but with all of his children. And as well as we get in here in verse 9, there is to be a sign of the covenant. And let's read that. Verse 9 of chapter 17. And God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after through their generations... This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised. And you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins. And it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. And he continues to give more rules about the way that circumcision is supposed to work. What was the purpose of circumcision? It was a reminder of the covenant that Abraham had made with his people, that through you, all nations would be blessed. Through your seed, all nations would be blessed. Here's a reminder. A reminder to you that you are my special people. And so God obviously takes this very seriously, and we'll bring this up here at the end. Now that we've seen two examples of signs of the covenant, let's get to the cup. And let me give you the four accounts where this is brought up. 
In Mark 14, 24, when the Lord institutes the Lord's Supper, this is what he says. And he said to them, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. Luke twenty two twenty. 20, likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. You look as well in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty five that we've already read. In the same manner, also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And I just want to hit my point home hard again that we made at the very beginning. Every time Jesus brings up the cup, what is said first? The new covenant. This is the blood of the new covenant. Likewise, he took the cup. This cup, is the, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. In the same manner, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. What is the cup about? It is about the new covenant in his blood. That's what it's about, right? It's about the covenant that he's made with us. And what's that covenant? We're about to speak on that in just a second. But that covenant is that Jesus Christ came to die for us, that we could have a relationship with him. That's what that covenant is. All throughout the New Testament is the terms of that new covenant. That covenant he's established with his people. Right? And this is the relationship that we have with him. Because we are in a covenant relationship. And this is a reminder that we have a relationship with him. Now this is when the blood of the covenant comes into play. And I do believe this is something that's appropriate to think about when we go into the Lord's Supper. As long as it's in the context of the covenant. Matthew 26 is the one that gives us the remission of sins. Matthew 26, 28, Jesus said, For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. How are we in a covenant relationship with Jesus Christ? Because He shed His blood to forgive us of our sins. Can we be in a covenant relationship with God without Jesus' blood? No. Can we be in a covenant relationship with God without forgiveness of sins? No. He can't abide in sin. And so through His covenant, it demanded that blood be shed for our forgiveness. His own Son's blood. Covenants always come with the shedding of blood. We see this in Hebrews 9. Let's turn over there. Just some interesting thoughts about the word covenant. In the Old Testament, there's two books that use the word covenant more than any other times. Into the 30s of how many times it uses the word covenant. Can you think of what those two books are? It's Deuteronomy and Jeremiah. They use the word covenant the most. Obviously, Deuteronomy is about the covenant between God and the people of Israel. And Jeremiah coins the term new covenant. Right? In Jeremiah 31. What's the book in the New Testament that uses the word covenant into the 30s? The book of Hebrews. It talks about the covenant several times. Chapter 9, verse 18. He's making the point here that when the old law was given, this is a covenant we haven't talked about yet, that there had to be blood shed for that covenant to take place. The law of Moses. Verse 18, chapter 9. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet wool and hyssop, sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God had commanded you, has commanded you. Then likewise he sprinkled the blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of ministry, And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no remission. Let's first here just make the logical argument that we've already set forth. Why is there no remission of sins with no blood? That's because sin has to be paid for. God can't call himself just God if he's allowed and tolerated sin. So he's created a solution that we don't deserve which is that Jesus Christ's blood would pay for our sins. There cannot be remission of sins unless there's blood. There cannot be a covenant unless there's remission of sins. How is he supposed to be in a covenant relationship with people that are against him, that have done things against him, right? How can he call himself just if he has a relationship with sinful people? He can't. That's why remission of sins in blood is necessary for the covenant. In verse 19, he's given the example that Moses, when he dedicated the instruments in the tabernacle for God, he had to sprinkle them with blood. 
to purify everything. The Ark of the Covenant was there, right? And he had to sprinkle that with blood. The different items in the tabernacle, that he had to sprinkle that with blood to purify those things. Verse 20, it says that the book itself and all the people, he sprinkled, sprinkled them with blood. 20, Moses said, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Here's your homework, if you like that. Where did Moses say this? I'll tell you what I think right now. I don't know. I can't find it. In Exodus 24 is when he commands all the instruments to be there. I believe it's Exodus 29 that he commands that everything be sprinkled with blood. But nowhere can I find Moses saying this phrase. This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Probably Moses did. Like Hebrews, they tell us a lot of what things that happened in the Old Testament that aren't recorded there. We see that Abraham believed that God was going to rise Isaac from the dead in Hebrews 11. It doesn't say there back then in Genesis. But Hebrews gives us some more information that we didn't have through the Holy Spirit. But here it says that Moses said this. Who did say this, though? What does this sound like when you hear this? This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. If, I, if we hadn't just read it, where would you think that verse was? I'll tell you where I would think. Right here. This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do you see the similarities between what Moses says in Hebrews and what you see here that Jesus institutes? This is the blood of the covenant. For them, it was the sprinkling of the items of the tabernacle. For us, it's the partaking of the Lord's Supper. There's something really here, isn't there? We continue on. Remissions of sins is a necessity for covenants with God. We see that in verse 22, don't we? This absolutely has to happen. Let's wrap things up here. Are these symbols important? They are important, right? God has always taken his signs, his symbols of the covenants, as something incredibly important. Do you remember Moses' son in Exodus 4? Moses was called to take back to Pharaoh to begin the plague journey to free the people. He's going. Aaron's with him. Zipporah's with him, his wife. And their son is with him, Moses' son. And all of a sudden, Exodus 5, God tells Moses, I'm going to kill your son. Why did he all of a sudden was going to kill Moses' son? It's because he wasn't circumcised. Because Moses had not obeyed the sign of the covenant. He had not carried it on to his descendants like Abraham was commanded to do. If you remember the story, Zipporah is very angry about this. And she takes care of it right there. She circumcises her son and then throws the remains at Moses' feet and says, you know, you're of blood. She's very upset about it. However, God was going to kill him unless he did it. This is how important these signs of the covenant are. Does he take the Lord's Supper? Very importantly. If you remember this in 1127, right after 25, he says, Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Is that serious business? That's extremely serious business. Verse 29, a little later. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Is this serious business? This is very serious business. Would the Lord kill over something like this? I believe he would, based off what we read in Exodus 5. He doesn't want his people playing around with this. This isn't a joke. This isn't funny. This is as serious as we can get here. Because you take these things in an improper manner, well, then we're in trouble. Now, let me say this. Is there something special about unleavened bread and grape juice in itself? Is there something special about that? No. That's not what this is about, right? Let me use the example of baptism. Is baptism into Jesus Christ serious business? Absolutely. Is water important? I mean, it's important for you to stay healthy. But nothing like spiritual thoughts like this. In Hebrews 9, if you're still there, verse 13, it says, For if blood and bulls and goats and the ashes of the heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh. We've already talked about this. You sprinkle blood on something, you purify it. Verse 14, How much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. 
He doesn't tell us here when that happens. He just says that Jesus Christ too sprinkles blood on us to purify us. In chapter 10, he tells us when that does happen. Look at verse 22 of chapter 10 of Hebrews. He says there, Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Washed with pure water. What does he have to be talking about there? He has to be talking about baptism, doesn't he? Baptism is a symbol. It's a sign of the covenant. However, is it important that we do it? Absolutely. Is it important that we do it right? Absolutely. But is there something special about the water? Or what's special is that we do it with faith and obedience to the truth, knowing that Jesus sprinkles our heart with His blood. That's what's significant about it. That's what makes it important. But the symbol itself needs to be revered. Back to the rainbow, right? When the rainbow was in the sky, what was God supposed to do? Or what did God tell us He was going to do? He was going to remember His covenant. When we've been commanded to take the Lord's Supper, and we take the cup, what has God commanded us to do? For us to remember His covenant. Do this in remembrance of me. We took the Lord's Supper a couple, a little while ago, I guess. Did you remember the covenant? I hope you did. Because it's what we've been commanded to do, right? Thank you so much for your attention this morning. And I just wanted to again come back and bring how important these symbols are. Not because there's something special about the material itself, but there's something special about the worship activity that we do together. Because God has commanded us to remember his covenant. If there's anyone here this morning that has not been baptized in the Christ, you have not had Jesus sprinkle your heart with his own blood. That hasn't happened yet. And so the reason why that ha- hasn't happened yet, Hebrews says that you don't have a clear conscience. There is no conscience there. There isn't that, you know, hopeful feeling that we have when we're baptized. Probably in reality, and I know this happened to me, if you haven't been baptized, what is in your heart? There's probably a lot of guilt. There's probably a lot of sorrow. There's probably a lot of anxiety. Because Jesus hasn't sprinkled your heart yet. You have not been purified yet by the blood of Jesus. What's wonderful all about this is that Jesus, while we were still sinners, died for the ungodly. He made this all possible just so he could have a covenant relationship with you. If you'd like to be in a covenant relationship with the Lord and receive all those blessings, why not have Jesus come and sprinkle your heart through the waters of baptism? If you will come forward as we stand and sing.